right place. You don't have to fear what man can do to you. You don't have to fear what can happen to you. Uh, your, your life is in God's hands. Uh, your soul is in God's hands, and that's a good place to be. Uh, if you would, take your Holy King James Bible this morning. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 21. Uh, Luke chapter 21, we're going to read verses 25 and 26. I want to remind you uh, to vote uh, that's coming this coming Tuesday. This Tuesday, make sure and get out and vote. Um, on the back, I want to thank Sister Zelma. She put out some uh, voting guides that tell where people stand on the issues, uh, specifically abortion. So before you leave, if you want to grab one of those, if you want to see where the candidates fall on the issue of abortion, make sure and pick one of those up. And thank Sister Zelma for doing all the hard work of doing the research uh, to get that done for us. I greatly appreciate that. Um, so in our, in our Holy King James Bible... Luke chapter 21, we're going to read verses 25 and 26 for our text this morning. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, and we come to you this morning asking for your blessings on this service. Lord, we ask for thy Holy Spirit to have a free course to, to move and to work in this service, and Lord, to, uh, to uh, just help the hearts that are here. Lord, we know that you know the state of this world. You know the needs both physical and spiritual. Physically, we pray for those who have been afflicted by the virus that is spreading. We pray, Lord, for the families affected and ask for comfort. We ask for healing. Uh, bless those who are working for a cure. Give them wisdom. Spiritually, we know this world sits in sin. It sits in darkness. And we pray that this pandemic, as tragic as it is, and knowing that the devil is the father of lies and desires to kill and to steal and to destroy, but God, you are good. And even in this fallen world, you can use darkness to show us our lost condition and bring many people to salvation. We pray, Lord, today uh, that people may be at home or in the coming weeks, we pray, Lord, that you'll use this time to wake people up, that they'll contemplate their soul and their eternal existence. Bring them out of darkness and bring them into the Savior's light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of the message this morning is Fear or Faith. Fear or Faith. Uh, if you don't have faith, you should fear. Uh, that, that is the point of the whole sermon. Fear or faith. If you don't have faith, you should fear. Many times people fear the wrong things because they don't have faith in the right things. Let me say that again. Many times people fear the wrong things because they don't have faith in the right things. This morning I began by saying, listen, if you fear God, if you have a healthy respect and fear for God, a fear that has brought you down to a place to your knees where you've confessed your sin and confessed them to God Almighty and been covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins have been cleansed, you have feared God enough that nothing else on this earth should fear you other than God himself. If your fear is in the right place and your faith is in the right place, you can firmly be sure that your, hand, your life is in God's hands, uh, your breath is in God's hands, and that's a good place to rest. Amen? Amen. Christians uh, can be afraid, but our faith should overcome our fear. Let me say that again. Christians can be afraid, but our faith should always overcome our fear. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 26, and there should be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. Men's hearts failing them for fear. In the Bible, this is Jesus' words, and what he's doing is he's going through and talking about what is going to happen in the future, how that the, the moon and the sun, and there's going to be signs in the heavens, and the Bible says that the waves are going to roar and men's hearts are going to fail, and there's going to be signs to see these things coming upon the earth. And the Bible says that the powers of heaven shall be shaken. It, says, it doesn't say they might be shaken. It says the powers of heaven shall be shaken to the point where those who have no faith in what they should have faith in, which is God, will fear so much that their hearts will betray them. It's not talking to the saved here. And it's not talking about the things that we're dealing with today. It's talking about a future time when things will be worse on this earth. And men's hearts will fail them because of fear. The scripture is specifically talking about the heart without faith in God. I want you to think about that. The coronavirus has many afraid today. 
And I'll speak a little bit about that. First of all, I want to say as Christians, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I don't want to make light of the situation in any way. I think we should be wise. I think we should listen to those doctors who were out saying, listen, this is not a time to panic. This is a time to take good advice. I think we should uh, follow the advice where we wash our hands very properly. Amen? I, I'm, I'm appalled when I go into a restroom in a public place and see people use the restroom and leave and never wash their hands. Maybe this will change where people start washing their hands more and we can put an end to some of these sicknesses that, that come because people are unclean. All through the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament, God said, wash, wash, wash. Why? Because God is concerned not only with your soul, which is the most important, but he's also concerned with your physical well-being. And he says, wash over and over and over and all kinds of washings because God wants his people to be clean people, both inside and out. Amen. Amen. So when we hear that we should wash your hands, do it. Amen? Amen. When we hear that you should not touch your, your eyes and your mouth and with your hands, uh, that's great advice. I think we should follow that. As wise Christians, we should, we should try to follow that as much as humanly possible. Try not to touch your face with your hands. They say that uh, the vast majority of deaths are those, uh, you know, 80 plus. But I'll say, you know, if you're 60 years of age, you have pre-existing pre health issues, you may want to isolate yourself. You may want to quarantine yourself until this passes by. Eating and exercise. We showed a video uh, on how to wash your hands, and it went through the three things. Eating and exercise can boost your immune system. We should want to boost our immune system so we can fight off the diseases that are so prevalent in our country and around the world. Nothing wrong with eating right and exercising to boost your immune system. Do that. Anxiety and fear weakens your immune system. Anxiety and fear, we don't hear too much about that, but listen, anxiety and fear will weaken your immune system. Uh, if you're a Christian, you're born again, uh, God says that, you know, we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be fearful about what can happen to our body. We know where our soul's going for all eternity, amen? amen. We're safe in God's hands. No matter what happens to the body, our soul is in God's hands. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. In other words, be anxious for nothing. Be fearful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. As Christians, what we can do is follow the good advice and pray that God will help find a cure for whatever is going on. The Christian, to the Christian, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, we need, to, we need to think through things that are happening in our world around us. Not always take things at face value, but look at the deeper meaning of what is going on and look and see. Anytime something bad happens in, in the country, in the world, in your nation, in your city, or in your personal life, you should always look and ask the question, is this God trying to get our attention? Amen? Amen. Or is there something else going on? The Bible says in Luke 12, 20, 21, 25, and 26, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You know, I, I believe that this coronavirus uh, with a 98% survival rate is probably not as bad as it's being blown out of proportion on. I believe it's very important to follow the guidelines and do the best we can to quarantine ourselves, to take, maybe not shake hands during church time, maybe, maybe distance ourselves and do a little bit of distancing ourselves, uh, but not to panic and not to live in fear. As Christians, we are not to live in fear, we're to live in faith. And our faith should overcome our fear, but we should be wise enough to do that which is right. And not, I don't want to spread it to someone else, I don't want somebody to spread it to me, I don't want to get the virus. But I'm not going to live in fear of the virus. I'm not going to let that take my freedom away to go and worship in the house of God. I'm not going to let that take my freedom away to go and do the things that I want to do and live my life for the glory of God. Amen? But I do believe that there is, you know, anytime something happens around you, you should look at it and examine and say, well, this is, this is really a warning of what is to come that's going to be worse. And how we act in this situation may be magnified in a worse situation. So I, I told them, you know, in, in Sunday school, and most of you are here for Sunday school, I think we're preaching to the choir this morning. But I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. 
You know, as you watch people panic and go out and buy all the toilet paper up, as you watch them panic and go buy all the water up, as you watch them panic and go buy all the groceries up, when this settles down, there's nothing wrong. I don't, I'm not for prepping and trying to prep for the end of the world. You cannot prepare for something like that. You need to prepare your soul for that. If your soul's prepared for that, you are prepared. Physically, though, there's nothing wrong with having a pantry, having an extra freezer or refrigerator, and having it stocked. So when there is panic, you are prepared. Amen? The Bible says, go to the ant thou slugger, consider her ways and be wise. She'll prepare for the winter. We should prepare for hard things to come. There are harder things coming down the road than the Corona virus. Amen? Yeah. The, Bible says, the Bible says there's really a lot of harder things coming. There's going to be a time when they look up at the stars and they say something has shaken the stars and it's just a matter of time before it comes and hits us. And men's hearts are going to fail because they're not going to be ready for what's going to happen on the earth. Amen? It was over 2,000 years ago that Jesus spoke these words, saying men's hearts would fail them for fear. Over 2,000 years ago, and I think there's been many fearful times since that. If you go back through history, there's been many scary times throughout history since the 2,000 years ago that Jesus spoke these words. In our country, the Civil War had to be one of the most dangerous, frightening times, especially if you were going out fighting brother against brother. Black powder rifles, black powder cannons firing. Certainly if you had been on the battlefield with the black powder rifles and cannons blazing and your life in danger, you might have thought of this biblical text. Let's go back to the Battle of Bull Run for a moment. The day seemed lost. Strong masses of northern infantry were moving forward past the stone house on the War Warrington Turnpike. Hampton's Legion was retiring on the right. And Bowdoin's battery had, been, had but three rounds remaining for each piece. Galloping back across the Henry Hill, giving up the command of the height, the key position of the battleground had been abandoned to the enemy. Men's hearts were failing for fear. But a general named Jonathan had been ordered to Stonebridge. Help was on the way. Hearing of the heavy fire to his left, increasing in intensity, he had turned the head of his column toward the most pressing danger. He sent word, help is on the way. He sent word to General B, help is on the way. As he rode to go to the position he was to occupy, as he pushed rapidly forward, General B and his men, part of the troops he went to actually uh, help, had swept back and were coming in retreat toward him. As they came back, General B in full gallop came, his horse foaming at the mouth, sweat pouring down his forehead. In a total panic, he said, General, General, let me find my place. General, they're beating us back. General Jonathan said, Then, sir, we will give them the bayonet. Jonathan pressed. Jo General, General Jonathan, after hearing General, after hearing General Jonathan, General B was re renewed with confidence as he saw General Jonathan grit his teeth, fearful but in faith, charging to the position he should be. As General B was renewed with confidence, he turned his horse, galloped to the ravine where the, uh, uh, attempting to restore the broken comrades who were, who were in disarray. And as he did, he pulled out his sword and he pointed to the hill where General Jonathan was. And he said, look, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall, rally behind the Virginians, and the day was saved. Amen? The battle seemed like it was lost. Men were in retreat. But one man was brave enough to stand in the face of danger, overcoming his fear because he had the faith in what he should have faith in, which is God Almighty. Looking back, the men took up the cry, and the happy omen of expression applied at a time when defeat seemed imminent and hearts were failing was remembered when the danger had passed away. This is a true story taken from the book, Stonewall Jackson, the American Civil War by G.F.R. Henderson. When there is much fear, what is it that makes one man run and another man stand? There's a lot of different reasons, but what it was with General Stonewall Jackson, as he's called because of this very incident, was because General Stonewall Jackson was a man of devout Christian faith. If you read through his life, you'll find that General Stonewall Jackson was a man who believed that God had his best interest at heart. And no matter where he was, though the cannons were firing, Though the bullets were blazing, General Jackson with a firm jaw decided, I'm going to stand when no one else will stand, and I'm going to show that God is in control. 
Amen? Amen? Now, we're not in a place in our time right now where that needs, where, where, you know, I'm not saying we're standing here today like Stonewall Jackson because of this virus. What I'm saying is Stonewall Jackson had times in his life when he determined, I'm going to do what's right when things really do fall apart. I've gone through the little things with God to the point where I know when the big things come up, I'm going to stand when no one else will stand and show people that God is in control. Amen? Amen. We should look at these times of national skier as what is pointing to the future when there's really going to be a time when people really should be afraid and their hearts will fail them because of what is happening. Amen? Amen. The position which Jackson had occupied was the strongest that could be found. That's what it said in the book. It was talking physically. General Jackson was in war, and he went to the strongest position that he could go to, and he stood there. And he showed his men, we must, when we've done all to do, let's stand. And he picked the strongest ground he could stand on physically, but ultimately, General Jackson was standing on the spiritual ground of faith. And his faith overcame his fear, and he said, I'm not going to live my life in fear. I'm going to overcome my fears by my faith in the God who holds the future. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you this morning, young people. Put your faith in God. Fear God. And you don't have to fear what man can do to you. Amen. He stood on his faith. We need some Christians like Stonewall Jackson who will stand when the bullets are flying and the battle seems lost. And even when his own men was running for cover, he stood there and renewed their strength by being strong in times of fright. The Holy Bible says this in 2 Timothy 3.1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. You know, I just want to tell you this morning that things will get worse. Israel's 72 years old. If you open your Bible and you look at a generation, Israel is, 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 is God's time clock. It's God's time clock for the future. When Jesus was on earth, he said, we're going to live in the last days. We're going to live when times are going to get worse and worse and worse to the point where there's going to be great signs in the heavens and men's hearts will fail them for fear and the oceans will be waving and, and God is going to shake the heavens to the point that man knows his time is short. And we need to determine right now we're going to be like Stonewall Jackson when the, when the, when the things really happen that we'll be able to stand when everyone else is running and say, listen, there's a shelter in the time of storm like Brother Chris sang this morning. You don't have to be afraid. God holds the future. Amen? 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 I was asked this morning, well, I, I was asked this morning if we'd have church today. The coronavirus is on everybody's mind. Many are anxious, afraid. Schools will be open tomorrow for final instructions on e-learning here in Illinois, but churches are closed today. Did you understand that? I was asked if we were going to have church today. Many of you will be going to work tomorrow. The children who are in school will be going to school tomorrow for e-learning, for final instruction. And I was asked if we'd close the church today, even though many, almost everyone's going to go to work tomorrow, and the children are going to go to school tomorrow for final instruction, and then they're going to be closed on Tuesday. The hypocrisy of closing our church today and sending our children tomorrow is overwhelming. <laughs> The hypocrisy of closing the church today and going off to work tomorrow is overwhelming to me. It was asked if we'd close our doors today. I, you know, I asked the question back, are the hospitals closed? It is the height of necessity for the hospitals to be open, especially when there is a major illness going on in a pandemic in a country. It is the height of of importance that hospitals be open when there's a medical emergency going on. The hospital deals with your body. The hospital deals with your physical body. The hospital deals with the well-being of your body and praise God for them. I'm thankful for every hospital, amen? I'm thankful for every doctor who's going to go to work tomorrow. I'm thankful for every nurse that goes to work tomorrow. I'm thankful for the work that they do in trying to prolong the life of your physical, mortal body. But what's important, more important than that is the church of Jesus Christ who has the true antidote for the soul that is sick 
And the church should be open if the hospitals are open. Amen? I think it's very important that the church be open. A hospital wants to prolong your life. They're, I don't think they're under any delusion that I'm aware of that they can cure death. We haven't cured the common cold. We haven't really cured the flu. There is no cure for the coronavirus. I think that's one thing that has people so panicked. There's no cure for it. Their goal is to cure a sickness that will allow you to live longer. And I, I, I praise God for them. But let's not kid ourselves. The, the body is temporal. The soul is eternal. Amen. And those of you who are here this morning obviously understand the importance of not being a hypocrite in front of your children and skipping church on Sunday to send them to school on Monday. Amen? Amen. Or skipping church on Sunday and going to work yourself on Monday. And I'm, again, I'm not saying to take this coronavirus lightly. I'm not saying that it should frighten you. Uh, it, it probably should frighten you a little bit. I said earlier, you know, if it was me, I would, I would definitely quarantine the nursing homes. This is attacking those who are 80 plus years old or those who already have a, a, a disease or a known uh, uh, immune system defect. Those people, I believe, should quarantine themselves. They, they, should, they should wisely get somewhere where they don't have a lot of contact with people until, until we know more about this or until this is, this is solved or until it just, it, it, it may be like the flu where it's seasonal. We don't know that yet. There's a lot of misinformation and a lot of things we don't know about it. But I want to tell you something this morning. I think you should examine your soul. If you're lost, the coronavirus should scare you. Heart disease, which kills more people than the coronavirus, should scare you. Cancer should scare you. A car accident is more likely to happen to any of you than the coronavirus should scare you. Uh, uh, flying an airplane should scare you. Uh, playing sports, many people die playing sports. It should scare you. A heart attack should scare you. Getting out of bed in the morning, if you are an unsaved, unconverted person, if your soul is not safely in the hands of God, you should be afraid this morning. Amen? Amen? You should lose sleep over this this morning. You should isolate yourself to the point where the TV's not on, where the radio is not on, where your cell phone's not on, and you should ask yourself these questions. Where am I at with my soul? Amen. Am I ready for death? Am I ready for the judgment? Am I ready for eternity? Those three questions should haunt you. And if the coronavirus gets people to the point where they will isolate themselves to have a free moment with their mind and their soul with God, it might be a good thing. Amen. There are a million ways to die. And if you're unsaved and unconverted, it should scare you every day to wake up. You should thank God for your breath and take that moment in time to say, am I ready to die? Am I ready for eternity? And am I ready to meet God? There are a million ways to die and only one way to live. Today, everybody's talking about the coronavirus. Yesterday, it was the bird flu, Ebola, SARS, the swine flu, H1N1, Zika, on and on and on and on, and I can go. Amen? Some of these were more dangerous probably than what we're facing today, but today we shut down the whole economy. Let me give you some statistics on the coronavirus. The fatality rate was 14.8% in people 80 or older, likely reflecting the presence of other diseases, a weaker immune system, or simply worse overall health. By contrast, the fatality rate was 1.3% in 50-somethings, 0.4% in 40-somethings, and 0.2% in people 10 to 39. Talk show host Rush Limbaugh argued that the media was overhyping the virus as part of the latest effort to take down President Trump. Saying that the coronavirus has a, rough, a, a, a survival rate of roughly 98%. Now, God, God says this, for, God had, for, for those of you who are Christians, for God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Unless you're over 80 years old or have another disease or your immune system is compromised, the flu is much more dangerous to you. A car accident is much more dangerous to you. A heart disease is way more dangerous to you. A sound mind says these statistics don't warrant a mass shutdown of life on the planet. There's, there's a lot of people who do not like our president. There's an upcoming election coming. 
when they shut things down, send people home, and shut down our economy, there may be a reason behind that. Obviously, this is a real virus that is really affecting people, but does it warrant the massive shutdown as opposed to let's take people who are 80 plus years and let's quarantine them and make sure nobody has contact with them because those are the people who are dying from this. You don't have to say amen on that. That's a question. But it's a question we should ask people. It's a question we should ask ourselves. If you have an ounce of reason in your head, you will wonder if opportunists are not using this politically to tank our economy in an effort to sway the upcoming election. You're not going to hear that from everyone. You're not going to hear it from a lot of pulpits. Global fear over the virus to the point that we're canceling everything. We saw the same thing after 9-11 when they started canceling things and we started losing some security or not security, we started losing some freedoms for security. Benjamin Franklin said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Listen, listen, as a Christian, I am born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. My sins are gone. The Bible says, fear not those which destroy the body, fear him who can destroy the soul. My fear is in the right place. My salvation is in the right place. It's covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. I have nothing to fear. I'm not going to live my life in fear. I'm going to live my life in faith. Amen? Amen? As Christians, you should be determined, listen, I'm going to be wise. I'm not going to do anything stupid. I'm not going to go out and run in front of a car. But I'm not going to live my life in fear. I'm going to live my life in faith. Amen? Amen? We should not be the ones shutting down an economy over something the statistics do not warrant shutting down our economy for. The hypocrisy of a nation or the hypocrisy of nations and countries around the world shutting down, pretending that they want to protect the safety and health of their people is amazing. Now, you, you say that's a pretty bold statement. It is a bold statement, but let me give you some statistics. So far as last night, and I looked this up at 11.07 p.m. last night. I did not look it up this morning. This was 11.07 p.m. last night. 5,839 people have died of the coronavirus. Very sad. We need to pray for those. We need to pray for their families. Amen? Amen. Worldwide, out of 156,730 cases, 75,933 recovered. The survival rate is over 98%. And we are literally shutting down our economy for this. NCAA tournament canceled. I feel sorry for the young people. And I said this in Sunday school class. I feel sorry for the young senior who worked his whole year to make it to a basketball tournament. His team was good enough, and now the thing is canceled. When this has a 98% survival rate, we've had worse things hit this country. We didn't quarantine everything, shut down planes, shut down our economy for it. Should our economy be shut down? Absolutely. But this is hypocrisy to shut it down over this. You know what we should shut our economy down over? 42.4 4 million abortions last year. Amen? Amen? You want to shut the economy down? You want to say there's something that's actually causing problems in this world that can be solved? Let's shut our economy down and say, listen, I'm not going to go to work until you stop with the abortion. 42.4 million abortions last year, and it was all preventable. We should have shut down the NCAA tournament until that was fixed. We should have shut down colleges and high schools and, and grade schools until that was fixed. We should have shut down every e entertainment thing that was going on in this country until that was fixed. But to be hypocris the hypocrisy of a nation saying, I care about my people, and these countries are killing babies in the womb is crazy. Amen? Amen. Amen. What, we could shut out down, 100, over 100,000 Christians were murdered last, last year. Might be something to shut down the economy over. Amen. And that number is growing. And we know about it. You shut down the economy over these things, these things would stop overnight. But in the name of coronavirus, the NCAA March Madness basketball is canceled. PGA suspended. NBA seasons canceled. MLS, that stands for Major League Soccer. I don't think anybody watches it, but it's suspended for 30 days. I say that for Brother Chris. <laughs> and there's a lot of people out there that will give me a hard time about that because I'm sure there's a lot of soccer fans. Major League Baseball has canceled the remainder of spring training and is pushing back the start of a regular season for at least two weeks. Disney's closed. Amen. 
Grade schools are shutting down. Public grade schools are shutting down. Public high schools are shutting down. Colleges are closing. Basketball tournaments are being canceled. The Riverboat Casino in East Peoria is shutting down. Amen. That sounds like the perfect recipe for revival to me. I mean, you could ask me, what would you do to fix this country? I'd say, listen, let's take the God of sports and put it on the shelf. Amen? Let, let's take the public high schools and shut them down and send the kids home so the parents have to spend time and teach their own kids. Amen? Let's shut the colleges down who are infiltrating people with crazy thoughts. Where, where, they, where they don't even teach, uh, the, the, they don't even teach that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. They don't even teach science anymore. Let's shut this place down. I would say let's shut all the casinos down and get people out of these casinos. Amen? I, I mean, I'd go further. I'd say let's quarantine the TV. Let's quarantine the cell phones. Let's get people alone for a moment so they can think with their mind, am I right with God? Sounds like, you know, I would be willing, listen, to shut this economy down and to lose my paycheck if it meant national and worldwide revival. I think the devil, sometimes he comes in and he's playing checkers while God is playing chess. And he says, I'm going to move this piece over here and I'm going to defeat your president. I'm going to defeat all this. And God says, ha, you go ahead and shut down the public schools and see if I don't try to bring revival. You go down and shut down the riverboat casino, see if I don't try to bring revival. You go ahead and shut down the entertainment. You go ahead and shut down the wicked Disney who is just promoting filth. And see if I don't try to bring revival. You go ahead and shut down the public schools who are trying to indoctrinate the children to, do, to, to, to be against their own parents. Who are trying to indoctrinate the children to believe that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man. You go ahead and shut that down and see if I don't try to bring revival on this nation. Amen? Amen. Sounds like a perfect recipe for revival to me. And I'm willing to give up the economy. I'm willing to give up my paycheck if we could have worldwide national revival. If we could have a revival in our family, if we could have a revival in our home, if we could have a revival in the city, it would be worth it. Amen? Now, I don't, like, I don't like what I'm seeing as far as the economy being shut down for the goal of maybe possibly interfering in the election. But God got that under control. Amen? Let me read this text again this morning. And there shall be signs in the sun... And in the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Men's hearts failing them for fear, referring to the lost who are not ready to meet God. They're not ready for death. They're not ready for judgment. They're not ready for eternity. If it wasn't so serious, it would almost be comical that the same generation, 31 years ago, that wore the shirts that said, no fear, are afraid of their own shadow. It would almost be comical if it wasn't so serious that the same generation, 31 years ago, I remember I was young, they wore the shirts everywhere, no fear, no fear, no fear, and now they're afraid of everything because they're afraid of the wrong thing and they don't have the faith to overcome their fears. Because their faith is in the sand of this world, not in the rock, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? There's no one in this church afraid of the coronavirus. Now, none of us want it. None of us want to die from it. But we know if we were to get it and we were to die, we'd go into heaven that very same day. Amen. That's a faith that overcomes your fear. Stonewall Jackson, I don't think he wanted to grit his teeth and charge up that hill and stand there with the bullets flying and the cannons roaring. But he made the decision a long time before that, I'm going to stand where God puts me and I'm going to stay there. And I'm going to try to build faith in those around me so that when times of hardship really come, I'll be ready. He didn't make that decision on the battlefield that day. Listen, this, little, this coronavirus, it may become a big thing. I don't know. It's already become bigger than I think it should be. But I want to tell you something. This is a good test run. Amen? Amen? This is a good test run for us to look and see what the world does when the world panics, how they empty the shelves, how they hoard things for themselves, and how they don't share with their community. You know, maybe our church needs to, to store up on some toilet paper so next time this happens we can give away toilet paper for free. Amen? We should be thinking ahead. Listen, this is what the world's going to do when catastrophe happens. This isn't even what God is talking about. God says, listen, in the last days, here's what man's going to do. And he says, and we shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Man is going to put out rumors of wars. There will be wars, but there's going to be rumors of wars. He says to the Christian, be, not, be ye not troubled. 
For such things must needs be, but the end is not, but the end shall not yet not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. In other words, there's going to be rumors and there's going to be troubles. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. And this is a good, this is a good thing. I think Stonewall Jackson had many times in his life where God was leading him to the point where he would go up to that ridge on the high ground, the high ground of faith, and he would stand there with his chin firmly planted and his sword drawn and saying, I will not retreat. Amen. Knowing God had his back. Amen? Amen? And it wasn't his time yet. Men's hearts failing them for fear. People who wear the shirts, no fear. Afraid of everything. Afraid of being offended. Afraid of offending somebody. Afraid of rejection. Afraid of speaking the truth. What people should be afraid of is dying in sin unprepared to meet God. If you don't have faith, you should fear. Lost people should be afraid to get out of bed in the morning. The Word of God tells us the sinners need to be afraid. Listen to this verse, Romans 13, 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Did you hear that? For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Amen? We have a world full of people doing evil and they're unafraid of God, yet they're afraid of a virus that has a 98% survival rate. Think about that for a moment. That'll blow your mind. We are shutting down airlines. Millions and millions of jobs will be out. Millions and millions of dollars will be out. We're, we're sending home kids from school so that those who are working will have to go and take time off to, to, to help their kids at school. We're shutting down the economy because of a virus that has a 98% survival rate. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't quarantine people. In this whole sermon, if people will actually not take me out of context and watch the whole thing, I'm saying be wise. If you're old, quarantine yourself. But we have a sound mind that can look through and see through some of these things that the world cannot see through. And we should prepare for worse things coming. And the unsaved need to be afraid. This could be one of the best things that ever happened to the unsaved people. If they'll actually get alone with themselves and fear death, fear the judgment, and fear eternity without God. Amen. And I would, I, would, I would tell you this morning, if you don't know for sure you're saved, you need to find time to think alone about death, judgment, and eternity. If you are lost, everything else that you are afraid of should shrink in comparison to these three things. Death, Hebrews 9, 27, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The judgment, Revelation 20, 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Eternity, Revelation 20, 20, 13 through 15. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. I would say to you this morning, if you're lost, you need to repent and believe the gospel and let God take care of your fear. Amen. Amen? I mean, is your life dark this morning? I want to point you to the light. Amen? I want to point you to the light, Jesus Christ. He can still save. He can still heal. He can still stay in a world full of storms. Peace be still. Amen? Amen. And as Christians, we have to be the ones, the voice of reason in this world should come from the churches and it should be thundered from the pulpits. Listen, be not afraid. If you're a Christian, you need not be afraid. If you're the world, you should be afraid to get out of bed in the morning. But listen, if you are afraid to get out of bed this morning, I have the antidote for your problem. There is no cure for the coronavirus, but there is a cure for sin. There is a cure for death. And there is a cure for the judgment, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen?
And we should be excited about that. We have the news that is greater than a cure for the coronavirus. It is the cure for sin. And it is found only in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're saved this morning, you have faith. You need not fear death. You need not fear judgment. You need not fear eternity because Jesus paid for all of it. God's most repeated commandment in the Bible to his children, be not afraid. That's what Chris is saying about this morning. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't get together on that. You think about it. All the commandments in the Bible, we, we, we know the ten. There's over 300. All of those that are not repeated as much as this one right here. To God's children only, be not afraid. You're saved, he says, be not afraid. You're saved, he says, be not afraid. What's going on? You don't understand what's going on around us right now. There's a pandemic going on. God says, be not afraid. Stonewall Jackson had the choice. Do I do, I, do, I do what I'm supposed to do and go where I'm supposed to go and stand where I need to stand? I'm sure he was afraid. But his faith overcame his fear, and he was not going to live his life in fear. He was going to live his life in faith. And I think the words of Jesus came ringing through his head, be not afraid. There is peace in the time of storms. Amen? Amen? And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Jesus defeated death. He paid the judgment due on Calvary. And your eternity is secure in Him if you're saved. Say, people, God's children should be like Stonewall Jackson in this life. When the cannons are thundering, the rifles are cracking, men's hearts are failing for fear, we can stand knowing our life is in God's hands because we've taken the strong ground of faith. Amen? Amen. Not the weak ground of fear. The world, the world is going to always take the weak ground of fear. Christians should be standing on the firm foundation of faith. Amen? Amen. We have nothing to fear when we fear God. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord. For faith, we thank you, Lord, for faith that can overcome fear. Lord, as the world is fearful and as we see that uh, it's only going to get worse, Lord, we know that there's a time called the beginning of sorrows. Father, we're just in the beginning of the beginning of sorrows. We haven't even reached the beginning of sorrows, I don't believe, but we're heading into that time. Uh, for young people, help them not to be afraid. Help them to anchor their life in Jesus Christ so that when the world is afraid, they can rest secure knowing that you have the future and that the future is secure, for that is eternity. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with the, those who are lost. Help them, Lord, to be fearful. Help them not to fear man. Help them not to fear uh, the things that are temporary. Help them to fear their eternal soul dying without you. Help them to fear meeting you without, without having their sin cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Father, we just pray, Lord, that this church can be a beacon of light, a lighthouse, can be a place of refuge where people can come and hear the truth. Help us, Lord, not to cater to uh, the fears of the world. Help us, Lord, not to cater to uh, pleasing men, but Lord, help us to please you only to preach the truth, to teach the truth, to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, and to live a life that others would look at and say, they're standing on the, the high ground of faith. We just praise you, Lord, for, for you and for the, the leadership that you give us. In Jesus' name, we ask for the blessing on this invitation. Amen. Ask for a song of invitation this morning.